So I've got Ben Patrick, knees over toes guy. So Ben, what did you have for breakfast? Steak and eggs. Every day? <laughs> That's what I have every day right now, yeah. Right on. I used to skip breakfast, so now steak and eggs working for me. Nice. Throwing a little bit of a curveball, so unless you've been under a rock, you probably know who Ben Patrick, knees over toes guy is. I wanted to bring him on the channel today because as someone that was 100 pounds overweight before, I know what it feels like to have knee pain, to have hip pain, and candidly, using that somewhat as an excuse to not get moving, right? It's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And this is absolutely your wheelhouse. I can speak to nutritionally how to lose weight until I'm blue in the face, but I'm not a movement guy. I, mean, I have my own fair share of issues. So where do we start? I mean, if someone's overweight, they're you know, maybe 50, 60 pounds overweight, their knees hurt, they want to walk, they know they need to walk, but it hurts when they walk. What the heck are they supposed to do? Yeah, let's cover that exactly. And first off, I'm just super honored to be here. I feel like lucky kid that somehow made it to be, <laughs> Dude, to be here shooting, talking to you right now. So don't worry, because I am going to show you exactly what to do if you don't have a sled. Okay. Um, yeah, my background was being hooked on painkillers for my knees. That was my excuse not to move. And what's interesting is that if you look on Google, like what do you do about knee pain? Okay, rest, ice, painkillers, stop moving. The one thing it says you can do is lose weight. But then the amount of people who reach out who they're overweight, they're trying to exercise and their knee hurts because they're overweight. Yeah. So it's like, how do you get out of that? So if you have a sled, go ahead and just start pushing the sled. Just like push it normally? Forward. Yeah, okay. and, and let's imagine if he was 100 pounds overweight, that's actually gonna help him move the sled. True. Whereas weight training, oh, yeah. Yeah. weight training is gonna be more stressed down on the joints. Good, good. And then you can actually grab right here with this and pull backwards. Okay. So yeah, I'm gonna make him work out while he does this. Yeah, and you just push through your toes. And already, we're into the next concept. When you're overweight, you have all this force down. Keep going back and forth. However you do it, however it's comfortable, your arms could be straight, your arms could be bent. He's having to push through his toes like crazy. And you notice he's that, working. Go ahead. Is it a bad thing that I push through my toes? No, you have no choice. Okay. To push the sled. Stop right there. I'm just gonna straighten this out of it. So, this allows you to keep, just keep going. I'm gonna make you go for a couple minutes. So the sled allows you to start building from the ground up. Look at his knees over his toes right there. That's kind of the point of knees over toes. Knees over toes is not better than knees behind toes, but they're both parts. And restricting some human motion like that has a lot worse ramifications rather than understanding it. No, I want you to think about your own knees right now when you, when you push. Okay. You don't even have to think about it. That's knees over toes. Definitely. Right, so it's, it's a natural part of a lot of different things in life. And you're actually loading, strengthening through your feet, through your Achilles, through your patellar tendons. A few more rounds for me. Which is interesting because I grew up as a long distance runner. So wow. I was never explosive in the calves. I was always like hip flexor work, probably doing it incorrectly. And it's like this, as someone that wasn't an athlete per se, yeah. like I was an athlete in endurance work, yeah. but never having to do anything explosive. When I first started using a sled, it was like, wow, I'm actually firing my posterior chain, whereas normally like running, it's just that yeah. old. Yeah, it's, and people even talk about how your feet can get your glutes active and all. Honestly, if you are pushing a sled, you're waking up your glutes whether you like it or not. You yeah. don't have a choice. And if you're going backward with the sled, you're waking up your knee health whether you like it or not. So it's a really natural human motion. I didn't have to teach you a bunch of things about form, like weightlifting gets a lot more like form dependent if your yeah. form is right, if your form is wrong. If you feel natural moving a sled, your form is right. <laughs> it's, it's human nature to drag things. And if we think, do one more push for me. If we think about being overweight, if we think of what he's doing here, I could put a thousand pounds on the sled, it just won't budge. But if I put a thousand pounds here, something's gonna get hurt. True. So there's this fundamental difference for your, like look going backward, he's loading into his knees right now. But if I put a thousand pounds on this motion, something's gonna hurt. So yeah. If I put 10,000 pounds, I'm dead. If I put 10,000 pounds on the sled just and I try to go backward, it's just not gonna move. So there's this fundamental difference. Your body recovers within a few hours of doing sled. So if your gym does have one of these, or if you're fortunate enough to be able to afford one of these, it is quite literally a cheat code and I believe it's the human exercise fundamental. Like if that was all I could do the rest of my life, I'd still be grateful compared to being hooked on painkillers yes. and in a cycle of surgeries. Because this alone 
I, I just reverse slided my way off painkillers. So that's the fundamental. You can finish if you have anything else you want to say on the sled, well, and then I'll show what the heck do we do if we don't have a sled. Like right now, what do we do? Yeah. Well, first off, I mean this is a this is a fancy sled. I mean, just FYI, there are inexpensive sleds that are out there. So I mean, a sled is still a viable option for many people. It doesn't need to be this crazy robust thing. But yeah, what do we do if we don't have access or the space? Like, that's a big thing yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. So first thing off the bat would be find somewhere safe. Okay. And you can just set a 10 minute timer and you can walk backward. If we think about walking forward, we're kind of just receiving impact here. Yeah. And we've all done that a lot. So we're unlikely to fix imbalances by just more walking forward. Although we get a lot of circulation going, there's a ton of benefits to walking. And there's maybe even more benefits for someone who's struggling to walk or in pain to walking backward. So walking backward alone has proven to be an effective screening process for falling in elderly. Meaning the better you can be here, the less chance you have of dying going down the stairs. It sounds like a joke, but it's a serious issue, falling in elderly. So just walking backward is the lowest level of knees over toes training. And in Asian cultures, they pass this down generation to generation, and they go out in fields and they walk backward. So they make sure that's like a safe surface, they walk backward, not to be too weird, but they, you would walk forward and I would walk, if they're worried about the safety. Yeah, I've got you. And now you could walk backward. So you can make this safe. Yeah. So 10 minutes walking backward can help someone even make it easier to walk forward. So I would say like, if you wanted to be able to walk the rest of your life, walking backward would be like your simple bulletproofer to be able to walk the rest of your life. If you want to run the rest of your life, then I think you got to start doing a sled backward. Yeah. Because you could just you could just run backward. Running backward alone has some benefits. Definitely gets a lot sketchier, and it's a lot more jarring. Yeah. When it comes to our joints, it's not it's not the tension that's a bad thing. Tension can actually be used for good with our joints. It's critical for our joints. The pressure. It's more the speed and the jarring nature yeah. of the impact. So that's where then something like a sled becomes valuable. But set your timer, do your 10 minute backward, and then use anything with a slant. And remember the concept how that load bearing down on us becomes harder to recover from. Okay. So when it comes to rebuilding knees, assist yourself. That's why I set us up here. After today's video, there is a link down below for Thrive Market. Now that is going to get you 30% off your entire grocery order. Okay, so if you are doing paleo, maybe you're doing keto, maybe you're intermittent fasting, you're trying different things out. Wish there were grocery stores that were dedicated for what kind of diet you were doing, right? Well, Thrive Market is like that. You just sort by whatever diet type you're doing and you can shop. It opens up a grocery store for you right there digitally for whatever diet you're doing, which is super cool. But the best part is using that link, you save 30% off your entire grocery order plus a $50 free gift because you're using that link through one of my videos. So check out Thrive Market after today's video to save some cash and get some awesome products. So typical like slam board, okay. that is gonna be the most commonly used surface. Okay. This you can find in like physiotherapy offices. You can buy them. Now people are making wedges like this. This is actually mine because you take two together and it folds up really easily. And then I use this as a weighted exercise, so I actually don't want any chance of slippage. I want my toes down and my heel up. Got it. So this is the same thing. So with this motion, we're mimicking the backward walking, okay. but we now have that eccentric force, that lowering, like when you lower weights, the stuff that makes us sore that we have to recover from. So this actually has more potential to develop the tendons of the knees. Interesting. Yeah, so I do this with 100 pounds on my back, this is why I have over a 40 inch vertical because in this, my weight training, like this is my bench press. Yeah. It's literally just how strong I am right there with no pain, but start here, start assisted. Why don't you try, yeah, you can probably. do it on here. Try 20 on each leg. So if someone's actively in knee pain and go ahead and stand on it and I'm gonna dial your form and right bring me your other leg yeah. and now lower only to your heel. This gives us a strict measurement. He can't push off this foot slowly. Yeah, it 
Exactly. Just how slow you go on the way down has everything to do with this movement and never working with your pain. Yeah. If you were going into pain, that would mean you might be causing a little more breakdown. Okay. Apparently a two or a three on the pain scale still works. I say find a zero. Okay. And go get a burn. Yeah. Get a burn with a zero pain. Yeah. I got ready for it. I mean, this yeah, is definitely slow. a good Good. Good. And now just for the sake of feeling it out, now to take your hands off, balance yourself. Yeah. So I do this with 100 pounds on my back to jump higher. You were 100 pounds overweight. Yeah. It's the same concept. It's not like I can do it and someone else can. We can all do this on some level. And this now is strengthening us to be in that position to run, to jump, to go downstairs. Yeah. So even if someone doesn't have a sled, you can, these are probably like 20 bucks yes. or something. You could get invented and get a piece of wood. I do think that if someone's gonna be loading the weight, I don't like them to be standing all the way on it. I like the toes down. Yeah, a little bit more, yeah. Like in a CrossFit gym, you have those bumper plates. Yep. Boom, you got yourself a step. So I use a six inch step. I use two 45 pound bumper plates. I put this on top and then I treat this like a weighted exercise. I do eight sets, like I do four warm-up sets, starting body weight, then bar, then, and, I, and then I do four working sets with like over 100 pounds on my back. I really notice how this illuminates issues in my hip too, on my left side. Like it illuminates it for me, like the right side is super stable. This side, I feel I'm cocked off to the side to kind of counterbalance yeah. because I've got some TFL issues. In uh, that, so. Apparently you do get some strength things through here. Yeah. And then I do a lot of mobility work through the hips. So I think it has a nice yin yang yeah. of the stability. For sure. And as you start to load, so the stability plus the mobility stuff. Could, you, this, could you use this as a, uh, an activation move as well too? Or is it really just a... Some a people do. Yeah. Sometimes I do this like before playing basketball. Other people do it before CrossFit. A lot of people use my stuff before CrossFit or before powerlifting, things yeah. like that. No, that's interesting. That's, it's funny because as a... It, it's like... I had the worst of both worlds in a lot of ways. I started out as just a repetitive distance runner. Yeah. So I ran my first marathon when I was 11 and wow. I probably wasn't done growing either, right? So, wow. but that was all training to like, there was no, in that sport, like I was never ever squatting. So everything was like, my maximum amount of knee flexion was like this, right? Yeah. You know, I'm just going low and slow. So never really built that up. And then after that, get super overweight, right? So it was like, that's a tough combination. I'm so weak in that lower hamstring yeah. as a result of that. And so like, that is a killer for me. Yeah. And like, I get concerned about myself. When I'm 60, like, how are my knees gonna be? Like, I'm yeah. fine now because I'm yeah. young and fresh and my diet's good, but what's gonna happen when I'm 60, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so pain-free reps, all I do, people reach out all day long on social media. I have this condition and that condition. I don't address any conditions. Yeah. Just pain-free ability. Because mm -hmm. every study, on the knee or in any part, it's gonna keep showing that more ability without pain, you have less chance of injury. Less so if you were when I started this, I couldn't even do I couldn't even do my own body weight. Really? Yeah, without excruciating pain. I was I had some of the worst knees of anyone I knew. So I had to start assisted like this to even get into it. Hmm. So by changing the ability over time, how if I'm going to go play basketball, how well do you think my knees are going to do in these positions <laughs> if I can't even handle my own weight without True. pain? Yeah. First, if I can do a hundred, if I can, if I can do this without knee pain, well, no wonder I play basketball and it feels like I'm 12 years old or something. Yeah. Actually, I had knee pain at 12, <laughs> so it feels like I'm eight or nine years old. Yeah. But it's not just about not being in pain; it's also about the strength. As a little kid, we're so mobile; we don't have pain. But the outside world is pretty dangerous against us because we're weak. Yeah. So the trick for longevity to me seems like a just a simple math equation of the strength, but the mobility. So if you if you can squat a thousand here, but you can't go there without pain, that's gonna be a rough combo for longevity. Yeah. yeah. It's such an interesting like from the weight loss side of things. I can speak to this is that people they want to get the most metabolic drive as much as possible, right? So it's like people that are overweight, they just jump in, okay, how do I get into like a Metcon immediately? Or how do I, how do I just start throwing as much weight as I can on my back immediately? And I think it's really important to understand from a weight loss perspective that you probably need to start with these kinds of things first and let the diet do the bulk of the work in the beginning. And then you can slowly have this change, right? It's, it's you can't put the cart before the horse. And I know like when you talk to the fitness community, generally speaking, 
sometimes they'll they'll rain on things like this because like no no people that are overweight they just need to get moving they need to get the most amount of metabolic drive that they can and they need to do what they can to lose weight and arguably exercise might even be a better way to lose weight than nutrition but nutrition is an easier human lever to pull because it's quicker it's quicker on the draw if you're overweight so it's doing moves like this need to come first before you start overthinking resistance training and everything like that otherwise you're gonna have a pretty short-lived resistance training career if you want to call it that yeah if you decide to lose weight you start running miles a day and you feel great fantastic but i have the thousands of people in my dms who did that and now are on the operating table for their knees and you still have a cheat code i would put any amount of money take any kind of exercise and i i believe that that doing a sled Making sure to go backward as much as forward is going to be up there with like the top metabolic activities. Oh, I totally And without agree. the injury. So SLED is still my cheat code. It'll always be my cheat code. And I'll keep promoting it because of how workable it is. And it's helped so many people get out of it. However, if you did a 10 minute backward walk, is that going to burn as much calories as the SLED? No, but it's going to do something. And it's going to start getting those feet active. And then do three sets of 20 here. And you're getting some... Yep. That's going to get some metabolic demand going. Yep, totally. And now when you're not injured, and now you can do the things you want. So that's my whole game is bulletproofing reserve. Like, how, how much extra bulletproofing do I have versus the things I want to do in life? Yep. That gives me the stability to keep doing those things. So that workout, 10 minutes, three sets of 20 there, then whatever weight someone's trying to lose, they're simply going to have a better chance of losing it without some kind of setback. That's perfect. And if you, if you take that and you pivot it, just let's talk nutrition metabolically for a second and how we can yeah. piggyback off of this, right? Because one of the things that we have to think at, uh, think of, and if you look at just in a big umbrella of it, not getting super granular, okay, inflammation, people understand sort of in a simple term what inflammation is, but I want to focus on inflammation and insulin resistance, right? If people are overweight, the likelihood of them being insulin resistant is extremely high. We're already talking like close to 60% of the population in general, okay. overweight or not, is insulin resistant or diabetic. If you categorize that into overweight, it's probably a very large percentage of overweight people are insulin resistant. And why do I mention that? Well, insulin resistance and inflammation go hand in hand. It's a vicious cycle, okay? So one feeds the other. So forget which came first, the chicken or the egg. They both feed each other. If you've got one, more than likely you've got the other. Interference, it's a, like, inflammation is almost like an interference where the glucose can't really communicate with the cell properly in a very colloquial way of putting it. What does this have to do with everything we're talking about today? Okay, well, one of the biggest problems overweight people face is their cells cannot suck up glucose very well because that whole communication system is out of whack. So glucose piles up in the bloodstream, leads to more inflammation, leads to more pain. Okay, so then you're just going further on down this line. Okay, now I want you to think about for a second, what's the best possible way that you can get your glucose levels managed? Okay, forget about nutrition. The best possible way you can get your glucose levels managed is by exercising, by moving. Easier said than done, right? The reason why this is so beneficial is because the more that you are moving the muscles, the more that they are able to suck up glucose without insulin being needed. Okay, it's called insulin independent glucose uptake. So without insulin even being needed, without the pancreas producing insulin, your cells will suck up glucose when you're moving. Okay, it's a pretty magical thing if you ask me. So then it begs the question, okay, well, how do I get the maximum amount of muscles moving in my body to act as a glucose sink to suck up that glucose and ultimately lower your HbA1c, ultimately lower that inflammatory response in your body? Sleds. Think about it. Okay, we all think we need to go into the gym and we need to squat. Yes, squat, compound move, full body move, you're moving everything. Great. If you can do it and you are seasoned with it, heck yeah. Okay, but if you are overweight, the sled is going to be the best way, in my humble opinion, that you are activating just about all those muscles. So I'm speaking purely from a metabolic side, right? Not an expert in your world. But if you're tensing up everything, there are documented bodies of research that just flexing your muscles sucks up glucose into them. Literally flexing will actually suck up glucose and actually lower your glucose levels. It's you know negligible, but still it doesn't. So when you're in this position and everything is, everything, I mean, look at everything, right? All the way from the giant muscles in my lats, to the biceps, to the forearms, to the knees, to everything, everything is activating, the largest muscle in the body. If you were to do five minutes of sled pushes and then look at your glucose levels, phew, if you were wearing a CGM or something. So from a metabolic side of things, sled pushes, sled pulls, you're also getting a huge metabolic benefit that's gonna in turn help your pain from a metabolic side of things too.
So does that make sense? Yeah, I'm yeah. striking for it. So it, there, there's two sides that we have to you know, look to this. And then people are always kind of questioning, well, well what can I do from a nutrition side of things uh, to really combat this? I mean, yes, number one is losing weight. But I think if we focus on insulin management and glucose management, that's the lowest hanging fruit. It, it, just, it just is, period. And so if I have someone and they're starting to sled, I don't give diet advice. Yeah. So what starting diet advice do you have for someone? who's trying to accomplish this purpose. They're trying to lose weight. They're using the sled. What's the diet sled? What's you know, the... I have a, like two really simple things. Okay, I mean, for one, it's, I, I don't want to show my biases as coming from like a, a low carb angle, because that's obviously where, where like I've built a lot of my brand. But if you think of carbohydrates purely as a fuel, okay, and just forget about it, because there's so much just contradictory, weird information out there that says carbs are good, carbs are bad, this or that. If you're insulin resistant, you're not managing carbohydrates in your body very well. That's plain and simple. So we have to understand that if you are overweight and insulin resistant or diabetic, it's not the same discussion that we would have with an athlete that can have 500 grams of carbs per day. It's just different. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that the athlete can't have carbs. It doesn't mean that the insulin resistant person can't have carbs, but the insulin resistant and overweight person needs to keep a serious wolf at the door for managing their carb level with their activity, plain and simple. So if your activity, if your workout wasn't intense, your carbohydrate load should be low, period. And it's just like, that's less that your body has to deal with. The more that you can put yourself into what I would consider a carbohydrate deficit via your workout, the better chances of you sort of staving off that insulin resistance are. And what I mean by doing it via a workout deficit, if I burn 100 calories with my sled pushes and pulls, which I know we don't always have a, a, a gauge to see that, but if just figuratively, 100 calories with my sled pushes and pulls, I would want to be fueled with about 90 calories. I want to be in that slight deficit. Being in that slight deficit flips a metabolic switch that starts changing the paradigm in how your cells receive fuel and everything like that. Uh, and the next one is, so that's just a very simple one. Well, it with makes sense to me. If you think of the carb as fuel, yeah. it's saying you could be the biggest fan of carbs in their job, yep. but if someone has a lot of extra body fat and they're trying to burn that off, and they have the carbs. Well, the carbs are effective as fuel, so they're going to burn the carbs rather yes. than burn their fat. Is precisely, that, precisely. I'm tracking. You're tracking exactly right, yeah. and it doesn't. It is exactly that. Word. It's not pro carb or anti carb. Exactly. It's precisely. simply the fact of how the carb. It, precisely. The very nature of how the carb work is why you would want to have carbs at yeah. times, or why you wouldn't want to have carbs precisely. at times. They're a tremendous fuel, and let's yeah. leave it at that. And if you think of a sink, okay, like you literally have a sink, and you have a drain in the sink, okay, and if you're running the water and you have the garbage disposal going and you know, you're throwing little bits in here at a time and you know, it's grinding, it's eating, it's digesting the fuel. If you load a bunch of stuff into the sink, a bunch of carbohydrates into the sink and then turn off the garbage disposal, right? It's, it's simple as that. It's not saying carbs are bad, but if you don't use them, you store them. It's just simple. It's simple from yeah. an evolutionary standpoint as far as like we, how we store food. So when we look at that, the other piece of the equation is People really eat these and it's super light breakfasts, right? And I'm big on this. As someone that is really touted the benefits of intermittent fasting, people think that I automatically am like an anti-breakfast person. It's actually quite the opposite. If you're not intermittent fasting, you're not doing this, eat a larger breakfast and taper your fuel off as the day goes on. And that again has to do with glucose management too. So it's like if the larger breakfast you eat, it's simple. If carbs are fuel or food is fuel, you eat a larger breakfast, you're, I don't mean a giant gross breakfast, but just a decent sized breakfast that's going to allow you to be satiated throughout the course of the day. This has tremendous effects on glucose management, has tremendous effects on the satiety signals within our body too. And you think about, you can look at data and observational data and epidemiological data and you can see, oh, it was when refined starches and sugars and everything came in. And that's probably the case, like when weight started to creep up and things started to happen. But another thing that started to happen is we came out with all these light breakfasts and on the go stuff. So what happens? People grab a granola bar on their way out of the door, 200 calories, boom, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, done. And then by the time dinner comes around, they're pounding 2,500 calories. But guess what? Operative stuff we're talking about here, right when they're about to be sedentary. So we've flipped this completely on its head where it needs to be the opposite. You need to be eating and moving. And just, it's like your stuff as far as moving. Get back to basics and move and do yeah. what's kind of counterintuitive. Same thing with nutrition. We need to like erase all the gobbledygook guru stuff that's out there for a minute yeah. and think about basics and movement and fuel. Beautiful. Yeah. Love it. So I guess with that, we'll wrap this one up. But where can people yeah. find you? Search knees over toast guy. Uh, I put a lot of helpful stuff on YouTube, Instagram, 
try to make it available everywhere. Right on, man. Yeah. Well, yeah. We'll be doing plenty more. But Absolutely. As always, keep it locked here on my channel and check out Ben's channel, Instagram, everything else. See you tomorrow.